It's chaotic. It's tense and it's relaxed. It's lonely and it's exuberant. It's poor and it's rich. It's strange and it's familiar. It's incredibly busy. This is Saigon, capital of a nation, heart and sinews of the gigantic American military command in Vietnam. ABC Scope, the wide world of people and events. This week, the Vietnam War, part 84. This is Saigon. Here with that story is ABC correspondent, John Skelly. Almost two million Saigonese are jammed together in the homes, hovels, and estates of this once beautiful capital. If you add those who live across the Saigon River, the total swells to almost three million people, all living within a 20-mile radius of downtown Saigon. It's the capital of a country that's been at war for almost 20 years. It's the seat of government, the focal point of intrigue, and it's the headquarters for the United States Military Command. It's home, too, for some half a million refugees who fled to the big city to escape communist terror and the bombs and bullets from both sides. The full fury of the war has scarcely touched Saigon. It's relatively safe. Despite the danger of sudden sabotage and shooting in the streets, it attracts visitors, GIs on leave, and even American tourists anxious for a feel of the war. Finally, there are the newsmen. For them, Saigon is a dateline, a place to sleep, a mailbox. This is Saigon is a report on how all these people live. It's not meant to be a comprehensive survey, but just a glimpse at how it looks to someone who lives there. Mornings in Saigon begin with a Dawnbuster show with disc jockey Army Specialist Kramer Haas. We'll join him after this message in just one minute. Our time is 19 minutes, 19 after 6 o'clock in the morning. We have all kinds of good music for everybody on this Don Buster for a Monday morning. Hope you'll come along and join us. This is your host, Army Specialist Kramer Has, the record man. Want to know a nine-letter dirty word? Inflation. Inflation is what happens when too much money starts chasing too few goods. It begins with buying too many piasters on payday and reflects in higher prices for food, taxes, souvenirs, laundry, and other items. Our time is 24 minutes after 6 in the morning. Kramer, the record man, in session with music, reminding you we'll have headline news for your information at 6.30. The story of Saigon is above all a story of two cities. Refugees have created an outer ring of shanty towns like this. In fact, this is less an urban quarter than a piece of land curiously sheltered from the war. Refugees have created a compost of shanty villages where they live with their children. Then there is an inner ring. This is the old French business section, nowadays headquarters for the very visible American presence in Vietnam.
To get a better idea of what's happening, take a close look at this old French map. Saigon was once called the Paris of the East. The French designed it that way, but the French never imagined that more than 400,000 people would live here. Today, more than two million people are jammed and squeezed into the metropolitan area. Saigon is the world's most crowded city, twice as many people per foot than even Tokyo. Just off the waterfront is Saigon's District 4. Squatters and refugees have built houses, roof touching roof, on what is swampland. That ugly black gash is where a flash fire last winter burned up 800 houses, making 5,000 people homeless. Shelters made of cardboard and flattened beer cans. No running water. Open sewers. American officials admit conditions like these are a scandal and feed the Viet Cong propaganda machine. Yet city officials are hard pressed. In three years, more than half a million refugees have poured into Saigon. Diseases of old age are hard to find here. Average life expectancy in Saigon was only 40 years. In a city with only seven playgrounds, children swarm everywhere. Yet there is a Saigon of the postcards, the one the French always remember with nostalgia. Nowadays, this is the American inner ring, a pie-shaped wedge of some of the world's most expensive real estate. A villa under a tamarind tree in this location can cost up to $2,000 a month. Easily Saigon's most dominant feature is the Saigon River. Song Saigon, the Vietnamese call it. Big muddy to the American sailors who have to bring their ships 40 miles inland from the China Sea. The helicopter drifts over the German hospital ship Helgoland. This is Tudo Street, the street French legionnaires once called Rue Catinat, after the name of the troop ship that brought them to Indochina. This is the very heart of Saigon. On the right is the Caravelle Hotel. That's the constituent assembly. One of the few quiet parts of the city is the Saigon Zoo. Here in the park are giant banyan trees. Buddhists believe that spirits live in such places. In one of the banyan trees, an old lady has established a shrine. It's supposed to bring good luck to all who pray here. Win Thi Han from Hanoi is 22 years old. She's known to her American friends as Candy. Her father, a civil servant, earns 5,000 piastres a month, about $65. Candy earns 14 times as much as her father and twice as much as Premier Key. She's a bee girl, one of the more than 10,000 who now live and work in Saigon. Candy has just opened a bar called Whiskey A Go Go and she comes here to pray for good luck in her new business. Few Vietnamese go to Candy's bar, but that's all right with Candy. She prefers Americans. If I meet the American woman, I would speak with them. I would tell them about, if they, for sure they would, some of them, they would ask me about, what do you think about American man? I would tell them about it. And I would like them very much because American men, there's some, there's the 80, 90 percent, they're very kind people. They're very nice, very gentlemen. But I would, I don't try to be as smart, but I try to be mine because be mine, that's the woman I'm taught with. See a woman, I'm a woman too, so we both understand. So I know for sure she don't get mad the way I'm talk. That even she have a husband come to Vietnam, she would don't lose a husband because all the husbands go back with their family. 
and why everything like no matter how much good time they have they always come back with family to do is vietnamese for freedom and this is freedom street the fifth avenue of saigon gi's will spend a quarter of a billion dollars in vietnam this year and a good deal of this spending will be done in saigon papillon is french for butterfly the astute owner has translated it for the new customers. With more bars than Chicago, competition for the GI dollar is lively. Things are quieter by the Saigon River. A short walk from Tudo Street is the floating restaurant called Mai Khan, meaning beautiful view. Two years ago, a Claymore mine planted on the gangplank killed and wounded more than 100 Americans. Today, Americans rarely eat there. It's a tourist attraction. And Denise Schreiner from Denver, Colorado, is a tourist. Surprisingly, more than 20,000 tourists visited Vietnam last year. The Vietnamese National Travel Office actually welcomes visitors and offers what they call several delightful tours of the city. If you're a tourist, taking a Saigon bus is not recommended. There are only 70 of them for the two million Saigonese. The sights of Saigon are limited. There is a stagnant pool at Le Loi traffic circle. And across the street, the Marine Monument, notable only because it was built in three days from quick hardening cement donated by a US aid program. Tourists in Saigon can shop at any of the dozens of tarpaulin-covered stalls that cater to the GI. But the boulevards in the city, once known as the Pearl of the Orient, are nowadays broken and rutted. More than a half a million bikes and motorcycles make Saigon more smog-bound than Los Angeles. Saigon traffic has been compared to a Max Senate chase. In a way, this is a pretty good description of Saigon itself today. Choke, paralyzed, chaotic, frantic, this is Saigon in 1967. ABC. Denise Schreiner from Denver, Colorado, arrived in Saigon with $200. ABC News correspondent Bill Brannigan asked why she came to Saigon. Saigon is, is where it's happening. It's where it's at. There's uh, excitement and urgency, you know? If you could talk to the people in Denver now, what would you tell them about Saigon? To uh, come and see for yourself. Uh, it's impossible to convey what's happening. Uh, I don't know myself, but uh, the pictures that you see at home on the TV screen, the reports that you read in the newspaper, the things that you hear on the radio, they're not real. They're not happening. The Vietnamese seem to be more or less uh, afraid of uh, the United States government. Uh, Everything that's done here, that's new in any way, the old customs, the old traditions are theirs. But that's really all. Um, they're converting uh, hotels into military billets. Not for uh, Vietnamese military, but for United States military. Uh, the, uh, the bars and things on the streets, they're for American men. They're not for Vietnamese men. Everything is, is uh, being designed so that it, it pleases the GI, it pleases the American government. Not so that it pleases the Vietnamese population, and I don't feel that that's right. How much concerned were you with the Vietnam question before you left? Not much, to be perfectly honest. I, uh, it didn't, con uh, the, the Vietnam War didn't concern me because, uh, like I was saying before, the, um, uh, there are too many reports on it. Your mind gets dulled after a while, and you don't even hear it. You say, you know, if, if uh, something really huge happens and they repeat it over and over, it might sink in. But, uh, oh, the Vietnam War, dem the anti-Vietnam War demonstrations and things like that um, annoyed me more than anything else because what do they know? You know, uh, they read the reports just the same as I did. And uh, 
I don't know. I, it just didn't seem possible to me that they could get that upset over something that they hadn't really had any first-hand experience on. Aren't you a little bit afraid in Saigon? Saigon doesn't really frighten me. Uh, from what I've seen, it, it doesn't... I, I find it difficult to be afraid. Uh, I, as yet, I haven't been afraid, probably because nothing has happened to me. I haven't seen any terrorist acts. Um, I haven't even seen the results of any terrorist acts. The only time I was ever af uh, afraid, the only time since I've been in Saigon, was when I was sitting in a nightclub and there were two Vietnamese gentlemen sitting next to us. And after they left, the management came over and were turning up the table, so to speak. And there was a Chinese girl that was with us that night, and she said that they were looking for a bomb. And I thought to myself, oh, what if they didn't find it, you know? And you sort of brace yourself. But uh, that's the only time I was ever really concerned, or even really ever gave a thought to it. It's uh, not real. At times, a good deal of what's happening in Saigon doesn't seem real. The city is caught between a kind of peace and a kind of war. It tries to accommodate them both. Nightclubs offer one form of escape from the endless fighting. Yet every night, the war draws a tight circle around Saigon. Here in the suburbs, the Viet Cong are at the end of the street. You can see the flares and hear the B-52s bombing at the city's edge. Saigon has lived through 22 years of war, revolution, and coups. In this Vietnamese officers' club, the war takes a back seat to the monthly dance. Two platoons of troops of the initial contact with the Communist Company and the GIs were reinforced. 30 miles away at the Air Cavalry's base camp, a Communist mortar squad zeroed in on the helicopter pad. 80 rounds rained in, wounding two GIs and causing light damage to aircraft. All the same, no one can forget the war for very long. There are more than 500 correspondents working here. Saigon, a headline news town, never sleeps. A story moving across the wire tonight in Saigon will be broadcast instantly, viewed over tomorrow's breakfast in far-off Philadelphia. Uh, Tiger, please. Among other things, Saigon has a telephone problem. Saigon is the only place in the world where you have to make an appointment to get a dial tone on the telephone. Tiger Central, nerve center for all messages coming in and out of Saigon. It works rather like an old-fashioned party line. When President Johnson calls Premier Key, the call stops off here first, and it's frantic. Uh, could you give me Saigon LD, please? I'm so sorry, I'm in line with you, sir. Repeat, I can't read you. Uh, Saigon LD, Long Bend, please. I'm so sorry, I'm busy, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Working. 
Carson. Vietnam's most famous voice, Miss Phi Hien. To everyone in Saigon, she's known as Squeaky. GIs, nostalgic for Vietnam, have been known to call from California just to hear her voice. The previous highest month was in April, in February of this year, with 2,917. The breakdown of the figures for the week... Some people call it the longest-running floor show in Saigon. To others, it is the 5 o'clock Follies, the daily briefing on the war at the United States Mission. And 69 others. Breakdown by region... A dense cloud of smog. The statistics and numbers are droned out by the official spokesman. And, like the smog, the facts drift and settle on the Saigon press corps. This brings the total from January 1 through April 1 to 10,746. This compares with 5,521 during last year. Bob Erlinson, Vietnam correspondent for the Baltimore Sun, is working late on a story. He's spent a week with the hill people of central Vietnam, the Mountain Yard. Notice the bracelets, a gift from the tribesmen. The communists are desperate for a mountain victory, declared Lieutenant General Vin Lock, Corps commander, because they have been losing steadily in the highlands since 1965 and need to make a big noise. The enemy's 1965 Highlands campaign opened with an attack on an outpost at Play Me and ended in their disastrous defeat in the Adrang Valley. This has been a routine war story for Erlinson, and though he doesn't know it yet, the next morning, along with ABC News correspondent Dave Snell, he's going out on what he thinks is another routine story. This time, he will be blown up by a Viet Cong mine. He will survive. And in Saigon later, he will write that story. Negative contact, car nine, we go, sir. Saigon is quiet now. Most of the town is asleep. But this is a city that is as full of paradox as it is of problems. military police, these are the dangerous hours, the favorite time for Viet Cong attacks. Tense, troubled, at times joyful, at times dangerous, overcrowded, a city between peace and war. This is Saigon. Unless all the signs are wrong, we're going to hear a lot more about Saigon in the coming year. For the time being, public attention is on the countryside. That's where the fighting is going on. But it's worth remembering that one in five South Vietnamese live in Saigon, and one in three live in or near the cities totally controlled by the government. The plight of the cities is now worrying American planners. To relieve the congestion, to make Saigon a better home for the Vietnamese, for example, this summer, the more than 25,000 American troops will be moved out to a new headquarters some 20 miles away. This will give the Saigonese a tiny bit more room to breathe. Even more importantly, it will help ease the deluge of GI dollars that contribute to the inflation in the city. But everyone knows it's just the start. To restore the people's pride in their cities, to make them islands of safety in a sea of war, much more must be done in a dozen areas long neglected. It's difficult to believe that someone's attitude toward the war would be influenced by whether the garbage is picked up regularly, but it is. To the Vietnamese, it's a visible sign of whether the government cares about them or whether authority is breaking down in the face of enemy pressure. Saigon today is a grubby, frantic city, yes, but it's also where the roots of a future democratic and free Vietnam must be found and nurtured. This is John Scali in Washington.
Join us next week over most of these ABC stations when ABC Sco presents new insights into the Vietnam War on the battlefields, on the diplomatic front, and at home. John Causier speaking. This has been a presentation of ABC News. When a